Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, August 14, 2019. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. If you haven't heard by now, the market was down today. We have a lot of stuff to go over. There's a lot of stuff going on around the markets. There's a lot of stuff flowing in and out of the news. There's a lot of stuff to discuss there's a lot of stuff to learn so let's get right down to business the first order of business is the market did what everybody was waiting for the market fell through the trap door and we had the big down day that everybody was waiting for holding on to their shorts just knowing they were right we were always going to be right about the downside. Just as of the other day, we talked about even if they continue up into the moving averages, we're still going to get to 75 or lower. It's going to be the or lower. The question is, is the market going to get saved at this double or triple bottom here? Or is it going to break through to and then through the 200 period moving average? It's an anything goes scenario. You don't know what you're going to wake up to. But here's what we have to be cognizant of. The Fed, the Treasury, the White House the administration, a lot of people around the markets are panicked. Normally, when the market's down 5, 6, 7, 8% off the all-time highs, we're someone in there now. I think we're around 7 or 8% right now. That's not generally anything close to cause for even concern, let alone panic. But we talked about the bond market. We've discussed some conspiracy theories. And the reality is that there's a lot of stuff going on to pick at. We have Iran, Hong Kong, China tariffs, the Federal Reserve, an inverted yield curve all of a sudden, a bond market that was screaming higher anyway, even while the stock market was at all-time highs. We talked about it then. That was something odd then. It was always going to be odd. It didn't make any sense. There was always a problem under the hood. But here's the thing. Let's get back to the fact that they're panicked. Again, we don't really know the underlying reason that they believe they're panicked about. We don't really care. To us, the market's going lower. The reason can be plugged in after the fact. But the fact that the government is involved, the Fed, the Treasury, certainly the president with his tweets, the market will have to say right now is certainly hypersensitive to news. We always say... When the market goes into these phases, large swings in both directions. They come fast, they come hard, and they come in both directions. We have to be careful of the gap ups. So you may see some kind of news released overnight, early in the morning, after the opening bell tomorrow, and that news will spark a short covering rally. The short covering rally will create buyers. The buyers will create more buyers and more short coverers. Hence, what we always say, buying begets buying. It doesn't matter the reason you were buying, whether it was in a panic buy or it was just in a buy. That buying will drive prices higher. Those type of rallies, whether they last a day, a week, 10 days, whatever the case is, those type of rallies, until we reach final destination on the downside, those type of rallies are meant to be sold. Those are sell-the-rip rallies. Yesterday was a sell-the-rip rally, and I know a lot of you did. When we completed the C leg of the ABC pattern, that was the absolute earliest possible place that a trader who's at least learning from me would have been willing to short the market. And I know what the deal is out there. The impatience draws you into the trade early and you got rewarded. Fantastic. Nice job. Kudos to all of you that took the trade. Couple of side notes as we go along tonight. On days like this, I can't help but turn on the sound on CNBC. As a result of doing that, I generally come away with some material for today. 
So around lunchtime, they were having a discussion around the table about what the reasons are for the decline and what's happening going forward and all that stuff. We know the discussion and basically I call it story time. Everybody sits around and they tell their story about why the market's doing what it's going to do or why the market's going to do what it's going to do. Nobody can ever prove one right or wrong out of story time, but they love to tell stories. At the time... The topic was recession. The gentleman I was listening to was very emphatic and frankly pompous about what he believed that the entire market is corporate profit driven and that's the entire reason the market rolled over was because corporate profits rolled over. Pardon me? No, sir. The market drives everything going forward. The market drops. Everybody lowers their expectations stocks fall then they miss corporate profits as a result of the fact that the recession discussion became a self-fulfilling prophecy therefore they in the future have a built-in excuse why they miss the future earnings release or have to lower earnings guidance for the future release but here's the thing it doesn't matter i spent my entire career studying this stuff and here's the conclusion that i came up with he can't be wrong ever he says with authority that corporate profits rolled over, therefore the market rolled over. Pretty hard to argue that point if you're not really that informed, don't believe in the charts, and can't provide a counter-argument. If the market goes down, which it is, he's right. Whenever the market goes back up, it will be followed by corporate profits beating lowered expectation. Once again, he's right. Job for life. If you're a member of the herd, you have a job for life. If you take the other side and you're wrong, you're fired. If you take the other side and you're right, it was an anomaly. We're going to do one more of these, only we're going to switch focus to technical analysis. Once again, everybody's right. We're going to have a lot of people, a lot of traders coming in the comments section of the YouTube video tonight saying, see, I told you I was right. The market got crushed. We all knew it was going to get crushed, but here's the deal. It was the MACD. It was the RSI. It was the ABC pattern. It was the XYZ. It was the zigzag. It was the impulse. It was the depulse. It was the Bollinger Bands. It was the Lupinacci vector. We were all right this time and therein lies one of the other issues why we become believers of whatever we were looking at at the time because it worked right now if we use the same thing we use and it doesn't work next time we scratch our head but we remember the time that it really really worked so we're still going to try it again anyway we lose sight of the fact that it might not have been that thing that worked there is a case where there are coincidences. We're going to start getting down to some business here on the charts, but I do have one more, and it's slightly of comical value, so I'm going to do it one way or the other. During the day, I take notes of things that I want to mention or might want to mention in the video after the closing bell. That makes sense. Sure. One of the first things that I wrote this morning, and this was at a time when we were testing the breakup candle low, and we'll get to that in a moment. I wrote... Remind them the risk that we just discussed in the previous video of the bull flag pattern and the fact that it can still fail, but the market could still stay bullish at the same time on that chart. Well, here was the risk. We went all the way down. We tested the bottom. They fought the bottom for a while, but the bottom won. And you can see what happened. The low of the breakup candle on this hourly chart was 287.36. So if we do something like this, go down to a five minute chart, put a trend line at 287.36 and you'll see what happened. The market fought that number or that number fought the market one way or the other for a while and then they gave up the ghost and that was it. Once they closed hourly and even started getting convincingly below the low of that breakup candle from the hourly chart, that was all she wrote. What are inside the numbers members finding out early on? Well, some of it from early this morning, you see, some of it you don't. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You know the way I think, so you can probably write some of it yourself by now. However, they spent a lot of time, this is at 1040, they spent a lot of time 
around the breakup candle low. So we're already eyeballing the really, really important price zone. Under normal garden variety markets, not having a decent reaction from that price zone is bearish activity. Refer back to the pre-market notes, getting below, closing below, it's not good for the bulls. So we're on top of it early on. This inside the numbers report is like the sixth man on the bench. It's got some really, really quality stuff in there every single day. I'm not sure how many people actually realize that. By the way, stocks on the move, this is posted at 8.30, quarter to nine in the morning. This is before the market was getting absolutely smoked. So guess what? Some of them still worked and nobody got smoked in any of these trades. The price levels are important for a reason. Stocks or a market, they're headed to a destination for a reason. If we can identify the destination, which we can the majority of the time, the 80-20 rule plays out. Here's one from the list you just saw, STM. 1706 was the target entry listed on the form. The low of the day, 1706. Not a tremendous trade, but 1706 was the low of the day. Bank of America, 2660. Didn't work. Where is it? 2642. Did anybody get killed? No. Market was down 3%. It's not like this dropped another $2. How about Tilray? Did anybody take the Tilray rodeo ride today? Well, I know how to answer that question because I know some of you did, and I specifically got messages. Congratulations to those of you that did. Some of you scored really, really big on Tilray. It's a rodeo. doesn't look like much on a five-minute chart, but you're talking about big swings in both directions. You have a low down here of 39, and you have a high up here of 42. $3 swing in minutes. And then look at the end of the day. The second target listed on the page, entry number two, was 38.80. What was the low of the day? Low of day, 38.75. How you doing? How about Goose? 39.75. It's basically a scratch. Bantered about between 39.75 all day long. That's okay. It goes to show you it was an important number. Canopy Growth, 32.30. We don't take this trade this is what I teach in the course, and I'll give it to you here. Came too close. When it comes back the second time, it's almost like it hit it and did the thing it was supposed to do. We don't know if it's going to work the second time around. We like to refer to this one as sloppy seconds. I don't like to take sloppy seconds. It reduces the odds of the trade. In my book, it's not the same trade as it was on the first candle of the day. This was the thing that we wanted it to do to begin with. Now on the second go around, not so sure about it. Think somewhere in that number, in and around that number was important? I think so. Back to the daily chart of the SPY as we wrap up the S&P 500. I just want everybody to understand and realize how all this stuff works together. These videos, these common sense market analysis videos, this is like the tutor session every day. You need to go to study hall, you need to go to the tutor until you get straight A's. Now the tutor isn't going to teach you everything you need to know. Everything you need to know, you learn in class, you learn in the course. The tutor is an assist. The tutor is there to hone in on the finer points, to make sure you fully understand everything. Inside the numbers, that's the third pillar of the success story. It's the third leg of the stool. It's the sixth man on the bench, pre-market and during the trading day. It's working. Net-net on the SPY, we could certainly wake up to a gap higher. We can certainly wake up to a gap lower. At the end of the day, we're going lower. It's just not going to get there how we necessarily want it to get there. And remember whether it was yesterday or the day before, I said... They're not going to just give it to you that easy. I think we were referring to going up to the 20 period moving average at the time up to 295. And I said, typically, they don't just give it to you that easy. Well, guess what? Today, they gave it to you that easy. Good for everybody that was able to take advantage of it either during the day today or prior to today. The goal here and the objective is simple. It's for you to learn, but you're learning for a reason. So you can use that information to make money. Anything else is secondary. The IWM, we know about the IWM. The IWM was weak. The IWM is weak. 
The IWM was not able to get above this trend line. We already know about that. The IWM is currently below, but this is a weekly chart now. So it's currently below last week's low. It's going to be very interesting to see where we close this week. Friday's close across all the markets is going to be very, very important. Are they going to try and save the market? Who is they? Who knows? It's up to your imagination. Is it the plunge protection team? Is it five guys in a room? Is it Goldman Sachs? Is it the New York Fed? Is it all of the above? Who knows? But one thing is for sure. There's more people that don't want the market to collapse than there are that do. Always keep that in the back of your mind. It's not going to prevent the inevitable from happening, but it might make it difficult to get there. How about the transports? My second favorite market leading indicator. What's the first one? The IWM. By the way, the IWM was about on par today with the SPY in terms of percentage down. You know what we didn't talk about? We'll come back to the transports. We didn't talk about volume, but we want to go to the daily chart. Definitely a spike or pickup in volume. But was this enough volume to say this is a defined low, it's capitulation low? No, it's not. Doesn't mean we can't go up and test some areas on the upside, have some whipsaw back and forth. That's expected. That's garden variety market behavior. By the way, this is not even capitulation low. We talked about it at the time. This wasn't the kind of low that sticks. We had more volume here than we did on this low. What does that tell you? What does that tell you when we start coming down and there begins another stage, a different stage of this correction, the one that looks like the market's never ever going to go up again? You know that stage. It's the exact opposite of this stage when everybody believed the market would never ever fall again. They do this over and over and over. May I remind you of last December? Here it is, last December. If you go back to the videos, they're all posted. What were we saying in here? We're looking for a low. We're looking for a low. What would happen if they broke here? They're going to have a waterfall decline. The rubber band will break. Then all of a sudden we start saying we're looking for a low right somewhere in here. We didn't know the exact number, but we did have identified the number. It's all in here. You can go back and watch the videos if you weren't here back then. That's part of the reason why I never really sound surprised at this stuff because it seems to happen over and over and over again. The media gets sucked in. The people get sucked in. The media sucks in the people. And everybody just keeps repeating the same routine. It's like a merry-go-round that just keeps going around and around and around. And nobody seems to want to get off. I'm happy just watching it from the outside. So what's the story with the transports? There is no story. Right now, it's going to be interesting whether or not they put up a fight at this double bottom area here. And here we come to the end of the week. We have two days left. The weekly close is going to be extremely important. Do they bust through or do they try and save it and make it look real good? We're going to find out. The Q's got smoked today down over 3%. Same story. Everything's trading together. It's all the same market. We've been saying that for a long, long time. I wanted to make mention of one other thing. It's on the lighter side of things once again. Sometimes I talk about the email indicator. I have a different email indicator. It's not a substitute. It's just like a secret email indicator. It's not going to be a secret now, but it was a secret up till now. Just like some of you, or many of you, I'm on some of these lists from other traders out there, marketing lists, option guys, these guys, that guys, currency, forex, all kinds of stuff. I like to see what they do. I'm curious. I didn't realize it until today, but yesterday, the secret email indicator was absolutely on fire. They were sucking everybody into the bullish side of the market. It was absolutely Hop on, ride them, cowboy. They're momentum traders, momentum players. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of them are very, very good traders. I have no issue with anybody, 
But the email indicator I thought was interesting. It didn't dawn on me yesterday. It dawned on me today. They were in a frenzy buying up the market like trading in and of itself was on sale. They were doing it right into the completion of the C leg of the ABC corrective pattern. I don't have a clue what they were buying, but what I see from a marketing perspective is their successful trades. So they're marketing 100% winners, 200% winners, whatever. If all their members get those type of gains and returns, more power to them. I might buy in. I don't quite get 100 and 200% returns as regularly as they say I should. Financials, same routine. Absolutely taken out behind the woodshed, shot twice, and they're not done yet. Here we are into this double bottom area. You would think, you would think that the bulls would want to defend that area. We'll see. Ultimately, it's going to be taken down with everything else along the way. Just interesting to reminisce 2747. We talked about it dozens and dozens of times. And it's interesting to see that in that general area, 27 and a half, whatever area you want to call it, whatever price you want to call it, you can see what happened. The market just could not stay above that zone. And here we are falling away again. The bond market, real quick, since half the discussion is about an inverted yield curve, recession, and all that stuff, I get all that. So here we are with bonds rallying further. Interest rates continue to fall. Eventually, this will reverse, but you can't do anything until it does. You never know where the top is going to be. We've seen this so many times before. We've seen it in the stock market. We've seen it in individual stocks. I get emails all the time about where to short a particular stock. And I take a look at the name and it's at an all-time high. And the answer is, I don't know. Sometimes the trader wants to get into a discussion about where resistance might be, extensions and all that stuff. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But the reality is, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, when something's at an all-time high, you're going to be wrong 80% of the time trying to pick off the exact high. Case in point, how many traders do you think suspected that that would be a high, went short, and got a pie in the face? I would suspect a lot because they're probably still short. They don't necessarily always understand where they're wrong and how to be wrong small and fast. Nothing wrong with being wrong. We're going to be wrong on trades. That's a function of the business. Being able to get out of a trade is another function of the business that sometimes we forget just where that function key is. And with that, it's about everything I wanted to and intended to discuss tonight. So I will pull the ripcord here. I am David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode.